Jason, give us an introduction to your patents with um, two-stroke technology and, and where you, um, how you came up with the ideas and where they that's, went. That's really a hard one because there were so many of them and it was like over 18 years that, uh, that we did that development. We had a contract working with Polaris back in the late 60s, early 70s, doing their engine two-stroke engine development. Uh, for the racing department, <clears throat> and we had our own race sled. Um, somewhere I've got a picture of that engine that I designed and built and won my first race with, <laughs> um, and it was a pro race. And that was the oval track ice racing style racing? Yes, Okay. Yes. Um, Except they weren't, they weren't ice racing. Back then they were dirt, uh, snow tracks packed snow tracks but later yep. they came ice became ice tracks um could you tell the story again about your your boost port patent and the how that was purchased and oh, so there forth were, there were a lot of those um one of them the uh, the back boost port the one that goes straight up the back um has to go up at a 60 degree angle so you wind up with very little cross-sectional flow area um, until the thing is wide open, the piston is clear down at the bottom of the stroke. So we came up with one where it was actually time, it was, the, the port itself was much higher, um, almost 50% of the stroke, but the timing came in at the bottom of this, there was a hole in the piston skirt that timed the flow into that port. And I've got a picture of that engine someplace. We had, uh, carburetors on the crankcase and we had carburetors on the piston port but the piston port had moved around to the to the uh, exhaust side so it, all the carbs were on the front and uh, that allowed the whole back of the cylinder to be opened up for porting transfer porting and were these was this porting experimented with on yamaha race bikes or were these on snowmobiles still that we're discussing you know um it was it was just on snowmobiles that we actually did it but it, you know any two stroke it would work on what would you guess the power output was of this if you had to just spit on uh, under we, had, we ran a lot of dyno time on it but i don't remember like 50 some horse gotcha out of a two 300 cc wow 294 that thing had to fly well you know what it wasn't that much faster than all the rest of sleds but being that everyone else was air cooled and we were liquid cooled it looked like we were speeding up at the end of the race or middle of the race yep. but they were actually slowing down huh. and we were trying at the time to get polaris to go liquid cooled but they didn't want to do it what finally forced it was um sound a liquid cool engine is not so the fins aren't vibrating right and, yeah you yep. don't have the fan, fan noise and could you repeat the story again about how uh the yamaha sent a representative to purchase your patents in regards to the boost ports that i you're... wasn't really involved in that negotiation um there was a a guy uh, apparently yamaha searched all the patents and so I knew what we had. And then this guy, they hired this guy to come to us and see if we wanted to sell the patents, that is to say my boss. And uh, so they worked out a deal. And, uh, and I, I thought at the time it was kind of strange because I think most of the patents by that time were close to their expiration date, but uh, <clears throat> they bought them anyway. Very cool, and, and you. I, I don't have any idea what they paid for them. Or, and you mentioned that these uh, patents were later used in Honda CR cylinders. Um, no, your designs. The, the actual uh, the ones that Honda used, they kind of infringed on our patent, but they didn't really. Um, they just widened the top of the port a little bit. Um, ours had extra two extra separate holes above the transfers and next to the exhaust port with a bar in between so very cool now what is your uh racing history with yamaha motorcycles um how did it begin what sparked your interest in motorcycle racing and what were some of the motorcycles you raced in uh, 73 i went up a friend of mine and i went up to vancouver british columbia and i saw a motorcycle road race up there and that was right after the movie came out on any sunday 
And uh, we had a friend that from here that had moved up there with his job. And one of the companies that they owned had a motorcycle shop and they sold Husqvarna's. So I took my motor home and our motorcycle trailer and hauled it all the way out there. We were gonna bring back two, two new Huskies, dirt bikes. And uh, by the time we got there, the movie had come out and they sold out of every bike that they had. <laughs> So we didn't bring any bikes back. And that later progressed to road racing your RD400, correct? Um, well, yeah, I decided after the seeing the, the Canadian um, Yamaha team, Dealey, I think, was the dealer up there. Anyway, we went to one of their road races, and I kind of fell in love with the idea of racing. I'd been in racing since I was 12 years old. With, quarter midgets and go-karts and sports cars and whatnot <clears throat> so and uh so what class did you race that that yellow rd400 in when you built that was that a I stock class middleweight production middleweight cafe sometimes heavyweight production I, I ran every class i could i would run every race during the day i ran the first two years i ran two bikes but i could run five classes with two bikes and then I bought the TZ750, and then I could run one more class with that. And later, I could have run two more classes because I put lights on it so we could run the five hour with it. Wow. And uh, and that TZ750 must, is, are they as, uh, you know, crazy as they've made up to be, or was it a fairly controllable bike? What was that like to pilot that? They were, a, it was fun to drive the first time. I forget, I uh, remember cranking the throttle and feeling my, my head just, my eyes sink back in my eye sockets. And and uh, I think one of the first uh, reports in Cycle News East of, of my first outing was that uh, I was wheeling out of every corner. Well, that's because I was used to turning the throttle full on for both the RD and the TZ. And, uh, that was a little different. You had to modulate the throttle a little bit to keep the front wheel on the ground, but it was fun. Um, what kind of modifications did you do on that TZ250? I noticed there were some drilled or some cut brake rotors and the cut areas in the front brake rotor. Uh, as, yeah, uh, some lightning things that, you know, didn't really make a hell of a difference, but it's something you do, you know, yep. when, you're, when you're racing. Um, basically, my theory with racing was if you wanted to win races, you raced, and if you wanted to do development, then you did development. So, so for the most part, really, it was get that seat time, and you know, you can only do so much to modify the bike, but in reality, it comes yeah, down to the I, rider. People, a lot of people modify things and they go backwards, they make less power than they did when you started, and and you know, it's, some people go for that very peak horsepower or torque or whatever but that doesn't really make for a rideable winning race combination uh, you have to have to have power that you can use and get to the ground and um, in combination with that rotary value you developed what sort of porting changes did you make to the cylinder to accommodate for using that on well, the TZ? I had to open up the crankcase so that the rotary valve could feed it when it when the piston port wasn't open, because that was the whole point of a rotary valve, is you can get asymmetrical timing. So you removed the piston port so that it was always open, and the only dictating... No, not really. It okay. Was, it was still there. Um, we just poured it around it so the charge could get up to the top uh, when it wasn't open. <laughs> ah, understood. So you but you but you basically bypassed the system so that the the only valve system was the rotary. It, the rotary valve yeah, itself. The, the rotary valve controlled everything into the crankcase okay so. that was my question i didn't know if it was a you know an assistant to the piston port if it completely no, eliminated it, it. it eliminated the piston port effectively got it what were uh some of your most successful racing events that you had the ones that you're looking in, back on in road racing yes in road in racing um well the fact that i won my first race on the rd um, and it's funny because I went through the driver's school and I went through the ride along where threw a bunch of us in the car and drove around the track and someone that supposedly knew what they were talking about uh, 
told you where what to do and where to go and where to slow down and all that crap. And here I am standing on the on the grid out on the track, and I thought, you know, I don't really belong here. So I almost pushed the bike back to the pits and said, screw this. And uh, fortunately, I didn't, and I wound up winning the race. And uh, I finished that season with five firsts in class, and I won fourth overall. Um, the club had a uh, CRA had a uh, one to nine or one to ten, the top ten riders. And another guy and I were actually tied for fourth, but I had more first place, so that gave me the fourth, and he was wound up fifth. Here's the, uh, the finishing from the, the first year. Oh, that's really cool. So that has everyone who was participating in Those that. Those are the top ten riders. Wow. And that's the, so which, uh, I see a course laid out there. Is that a specific course that's or is BIR. that? That's BIR. That's yep. BIR, okay. And was that where the majority of your racing took place? Uh, yeah, all except one race I did at uh, Gimli up in Canada. Okay. Which was an air, old air base. And it was a uh, combination sports car and, and bike event weekend. So the sports cars would go out and spill oil all over the track and we'd go out and fall down in it. <laughs> what is it that's sitting here on the table here? I see a machine uh, this piece. This is of... a uh, one cylinder crankcase that I made for doing, this This would fit on there if, if I get the holes lined up. I see. I could test one cylinder. Got it. So this is your... Uh... It was going to be, it never it never got finished, obviously. And then this was a crankshaft that I built for, and I just took the center section out of a two-cycle, or a two-cylinder crank. And that's just a TZ crank that's, a, that's a an individual? A TZ 250 crank that I own. And what this bike is? Here's me, and I'm that guy right there. And this is the doctor. And uh, you, you mentioned this was a rocket scientist that you developed, uh, well, I collaborated on. I, I was just a member of the team, like all the rest of the guys, uh, and I wasn't on the team very long. I built the first set of pipes for it, and I did some machine work on the clutches and some various things. But And for those watching the video here, what is the context of this motorcycle? Um, it was just a development project. Um, he was a mad, uh, mad scientist. And it was a lightweight bike, and it had a lot of power. There were two articles in this uh, same magazine. And this was a Polaris engine. What engine did you guys start with? It was an 800cc twin. And you mentioned liquid, it had a liquid cool twin. It had a Ducati transmission. Yep. And uh, it was was it out of a snowmobile, or was it just completely a, a ground up build? Uh, well, the engine was a Polaris engine off the. Off the engine assembly line. And okay. He took it. And Notice the uh, tank emblem, Andrew. Tolaris. Notice Larry's T-shirt. Ah. We are rocket scientists. There you go. That's really cool. Now, um, what was this bike used for? What? Uh... Uh, it was a development. Um, we took it to Daytona in I forget what year. Um, and there's an article in, I think, one of the next issues of this magazine um, that talks about it. And then later on, after I wasn't involved any longer, um, some big test driver uh, took it and crashed it somewhere at Laguna Seca or, oh. or someplace. I don't remember, but and I've got that, that article, too. So the bike's gone? Huh? The bike is gone? No, I don't know what happened to it. I'm, I'm sure it's around somewhere. Um, what, uh, what were some other things with this bike that made it unique? Um, in obviously it's a complete crazy build. I noticed the chassis on this is, uh, you know, it looks like well, it's just there one no thing tube there's, there. There's an engine with wheels hung on both ends, basically. That's pretty crazy. And it was just done as for tests. So it didn't participate in as much for competition. Um, you know, it was more of a development project that, uh, the doctor wanted to do. Uh, he had had one before that called the Tolda, which was a, a Tolui Honda, and it was a, I don't, somewhere in one of those articles. I think there's a picture of it. But. 
for those that are looking to get into two-stroke tuning and are have a very entry-level knowledge on it, how would you? Was, is there any literature or things that you found were helpful in in starting from your from the bottom and working your way to learning about how to tune yourself? Um, that you'd recommend? I don't know. I started out in the early six, the late fifties, racing go karts, and that's where I got my my start in two cycles. So you're you're. Um, background on this was basically just street smarts and word of mouth and learning from those you encountered in racing and they pretty, they gave you much, ideas yeah. of how to so like for this jig except, except for the 18 years i spent working for the uh, air marine company doing ah right engine, engine r d and design and, and that was which marine company it's called aero marine it was a, a rich guy that uh, liked racing boats and he liked two cycle engines and he had the money to to put into that kind of stuff. Did you have any involvement in the Polaris Star Car? You know, that was happening when we were doing this, and uh, and that was kind of a really a crude, because uh, back then Polaris was just a bunch of farmers that didn't have anything to do in the wintertime because their farms were all covered with snow, so they went to work and built snowmobiles. And there were hundreds of snowmobile manufacturers, you know, backyard little operations that made a couple of snowmobiles a year or something but uh, so that was a pretty crude uh, thing but yeah i saw one um, when i was up at rosso in the r d department they uh, they had put a polaris engine in an airplane there was a cub or something some small airplane up there that they had put one in i had one in a d sports racing uh, car i still have the engine in my basement an 800 triple that would be pretty cool to see if we get in there later today to get a photo of that that engine that you still have. Oh, it's downstairs. If you want to go look? That'd be awesome. Let's go. So this is in what vehicle? It's a triple 800 Polaris, and it was in my D Sports Racer. Gotcha. And it was coupled to a Hewland five-speed. Oh wow! There's That's some there's some magic going on here. I see with uh, that's a water pump. A water pump. Yeah, okay. that was my own homegrown water pump. Yeah. I think the impeller was out of an old. Uh, 40s or 30s vintage uh, out, outboard motor. And look at the size of these carbs. Those 44 are... millimeters. Wow. So Larry, this is your shop here where uh, all the magic happens. <laughs> and uh, used, to. used to happen. Well, I'm, looks like there's still a lot being done here today. A quick filling on the uh, RD primarily. Really? Um, for the five hour race. And the idea was that you pick it up this talk about your seals mm -hmm. press that in fuel goes down the middle air goes up the outside it all seals with o-rings around the filler neck yep. so you have the nozzle has to be specific for the bike and i'm thinking this is maybe the one i built for a guy with a ducati um that wanted to do the five hour anyway wow and, and then you push down on it and when you see fuel come up in the tube you lift up and it closes the valve and and you're you're gone and the amount of difference here is how much fuel is left so you can dump what's in here without spilling got it i watch more guys during the five hour pour gasoline out of five gallon cans all over the bike all over the running down the hot engine i don't know why we didn't have a massive fire but anyway you got lucky i guess